our research talks now with our invited speakers. I'm going to hand it over to our uh, moderators for this session. So, um, Louisa and Carolyn. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back. So, as Tirza said, we'll be continuing with our research talks. We have four fantastic scholars here to share their science. Um, but first, I'm Louisa. I'm this year's MSA Student Council President, and I'll be co-moderating co this session uh, along with Carolyn Wall. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, Carolyn, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. I'm Carolyn. I'm a third year PhD student at Northwestern, um, and I'm working with Professor Dravid and Professor Chad Merkin on high throughput electron microscopy. Okay. Uh, so for our first talk, we have um, Dr. Jess Caldwell. She's a postdoc at um, UC Davis, and uh, her talk title is Using uh, Macro Scale Optical Mapping and FRET to Understand Cardiac Arrhythmia Mechanisms. So Dr. Cal Caldwell, take it away. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Please um, shout out if you uh, can't hear me or see anything. So uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. I've been really looking forward to um, joining this conference and he hearing all about different microscopy techniques. Um, so I am a postdoc in the Ripplinger lab at UC Davis. And I suppose we can say that my job title is physiologist. Um, and I think I'm the only one today presenting with this um, sort of background. So for my introduction, I really wanted to highlight or demonstrate how microscopy is such a useful tool for studying the human body and how the organs and the systems work together. And these here are just some snapshots um, showing how I've been able to use microscale imaging throughout my career to study cardiac physiology under normal and under pathological conditions. But today I'm actually going to show you um, or talk about um, something a little bit different. And I'm going to talk about a novel technique I've developed using macro scale optical mapping and FRET to understand um, arrhythmia mechanisms in the heart. And this is going to be something that is done in the whole organ. Um, so why am I interested in the heart? Well, um, heart disease is the number one killer in the USA. And in particular, um, arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats account for up to 50% of heart failure related deaths. And interestingly, arrhythmias often occur during heightened sympathetic activity, or as you may know, um, during the fight or flight response. And the fight or flight response is your body's response to physiological stress and, and, and how it um, ad adapts to this or copes with this is it causes um, a rapid increase in cardiac output. And these responses are initiated um, through the sympathetic pathway by a release of noradrenaline, either from the cardiac nerves or from your adrenal glands. And this noradrenaline binds to beta receptors, which are found inside the heart. And they activate these intracellular targets here, which positively enhance electrical signals, or as we call it, the action potential, or they enhance the calcium transient, and this is required for contraction, and together in combination, enhancing these um, two aspects of cardiac physiology increases heart rate. And because these sympathetic responses are non-uniform across the heart, um, in studies investigating arrhythmia and these mechanisms, it's very important that we're able to image the whole organ, so we're able to do this on a macro scale. And one of the techniques that we use in the lab that I'm in at the moment is called whole heart optical mapping. And this allows us to image these um, functional outputs across the whole organ. So how do I do this? Well, to optical map in the heart, we need a live heart. So I isolate a heart from an animal, and then and this one's from a mouse, and we cannulate it and we pump through a, a physiological solution that mimics um, your normal environment, so it mimics your blood and it allows the heart to beat. And then we um, load this heart with fluorescent dyes that um, change in response to binding of either membrane potential, which is your action potential, or calcium. Um, and these give out a measurement of um, contraction. And then what we do, we put this heart um, under an epifluorescent microscope. 
and we um, end up with some images of fluorescence that look a bit like this. And our microscope is equipped with extremely high speed cameras um, in order to capture these fast kinetics. I'm going to show you a movie of what this looks like. So um, for every single heartbeat, there is an initial um, electrical signal, so the action potential. Oh. Play this again. Followed by an initial electrical signal, and then this is followed by a calcium transient. Um, and for every single pixel, we're able to measure um, action potential and calcium in the whole heart. And we're also able to use this technique to look at um, arrhythmia or our irregular heartbeat. Um, and I'm going to show a movie of this. So, what we have here, we have a regular heartbeat. And then that becomes irregular as the electrical signals are non-uniform. And this further highlights the importance of studying the organ as a whole. So this shows that we can use high speed mapping on the macro scale level to look at functional outcomes of sympathetic signaling. But I, uh, what I have been very in interested in is to determine if there's a way to measure the upstream responses um, so the molecular responses to sympathetic activity, but across the whole organ. So cyclic MP, it's an important second messenger for sympathetic control. So I kind of figured if we can measure cyclic MP, can we use it as a tool to assess sympathetic responses throughout the heart? So for those of you who don't know, threat-based imaging um, can be used as a way to track um, sympathetic responses throughout the heart. Um, and how this works is there's a, a pair of closely associated fluorescent fluorophores. And because these are so closely associated, they will transfer energy from one fluorophore to the other. And these are bound to a molecule of interest. Then when this molecule of interest undergoes a conformational change, and in our case, um, it's when cyclic AMP binds to this molecule, the two fluorophores separate um, and we have an increase in the donor fluorescence and a decrease in the acceptor fluorescence. And the difference between these two fluorescent molecules will give us a sense of threat activity. And in our case, it will allow us to um, look at the amount of cyclic AMP in the heart. And what I did, I used this, I took this um, sensor and I put it inside a mouse and I put it specifically inside the heart. So when we isolate the heart from the body, we have fluorescence in both of these channels, which are able to transfer energy. And I kind of figured we can use FRET sensors um, as a tool to assess sympathetic activity across the whole organ. So in order to do this, I had to build um, a microscope. Um, and I did this by incorporating a FRET imaging system onto our existing op optical mapping microscope. Um, and we made sure this is earthquake proof and it has been tried and tested and it survived. Um, and I have just um, included a little schematic to show you a little bit more how this works, because this is probably a new technique for most of you. So this system has a uh, perfect imaging. We have a blue light that excites the um, fluorescent threat pairs inside the heart. This um, um, emits up to a beam splitter that splits our two fluorescent channels um, onto one camera and we get the images that I showed you on the last slide and then for each of these channels we can measure changes in fluorescence over time um, and we can do this on we use a temporal resolution we take one of these images maybe every five to ten seconds and then to determine how much cyclic AMP or fret is in the heart we just look at the ratio between these two channels so in real time we're able to look at the amount of cyclic AMP activity and this is across a whole heart. And the warm colors here represent high cyclic AMP. And then for any region on the heart, we can take um, a trace and look at the amount of activity of cyclic AMP over time. And then this setup also includes an additional light source and a high-speed camera so we can um, look at optical mapping. And in particular, so we can look at the electrical signals that result from the changes in our sympathetic activity. So for one heart, we can plot sympathetic responses and functional outcomes over time. And the objective in the lab has been to use this technique to 
determine the spatial kinetics of sympathetic activity in the whole um, organ and how these responses actually translate to cardiac function. So for my uh, remaining minutes, I'm just gonna show you a little bit of data I've actually collected using this setup. Um, so one experiment um, that I do in the lab is I, in isolated hearts, the hearts with the fret sensor, I use a drug to temporarily activate sympathetic stimulation. And I monitor the responses over time. And the resultant cyclic AMP activity can be seen on these FRET ratio maps here. Um, so uh, just a reminder that warm colors are high cyclic AMP. And then I further divided the data by sex because we know sex plays a key role in arrhythmogenesis. And then for regions on these hearts, I could plot, which I did in B, I could plot the um, cyclic AMP responses um, over time. And what the data is actually showing you is in the male heart, the rise and fall of cyclic AMP, so the, the rise and fall of the sympathetic signaling is uniform across the heart over all time points studied. But in the female heart, um, these, these changes in cyclic AMP over time are non-uniform. And we um, put this down to that there is a delay in cyclic AMP removal. So the time it takes to get from the peak down to the baseline, um, is delayed in the top of the female hearts, and that's shown in this bright um, part of the graph here. So this shows us that the technique of whole heart fret imaging um, then, um, shows that there are regional differences during the off kinetics of sympathetic signaling in female hearts. And this is particularly important because arrhythmogenic activity can often be attributed to heterogeneity in sympathetic input. So how does this relate to functional responses? So in the same hearts, I used optical mapping to study the key components of um, the action potential or the electrical signals. And again, this is in response to sympathetic stimulation. So panel A shows example action potentials. Um, and I, I don't want to explain this um, in, in great detail, but what, the, what these panels show that the duration of the action potential, so from the start to the end of the action potential in female hearts, this becomes shorter in the base of, in the apex of the heart over time. And this isn't happening in the male hearts. And if we look at maps of these action potentials, this is displayed a little bit more clearly where in the female hearts, in the base of the heart, the action potential is much shorter, but over time as the sympathetic stimulation wears off, these kinetics flip. And the mean data just highlights this again even more. So over time, the kinetics in the male heart mirror each other, but in the female heart, these kinetics flip. And all of these alterations we see in action potential um, duration kinetics were also accompanied by a reversal in the direction of um, repolarization. So this is just the decay of the electrical signal. And all you need to really look at in this graph is these arrows. So in the male hearts, this arrow is always going in the same direction. But in the female hearts, this arrow starts to flip and that's about 90 seconds. And this is when, if you remember the previous slide, we saw changes in the cyclic AP kinetics. Um, and we're also seeing that in the functional responses. So whole heart optical mapping has also demonstrated alterations in responses. Um, um, from sympathetic signaling, and again, this is in the female hearts. So to um, conclude, the novel approach um, for a dual assessment of sympathetic control and responsiveness in the heart has hopefully demonstrated to you that the spatial heterogeneity in the breakdown of sympathetic activity um, and non-uniform functional outputs. This is important because arrhythmogenic activity can often be attributed to um, alterations in sympathetic input. Um, and therefore the breakdown of this sympathetic activity might be a novel mechanism of arrhythmia. And we would not have known this without using this macroscale macro imaging technique. And that finally just leaves me to thank um, all members of the Ripplinger Lab um, and also to say happy International Women's Day. And I'm happy to take any, any um, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that talk. Uh, maybe we have time for, for one quick question. There's more in the chat, but um, 
one of them is uh, interested in given that the heart is beating and ac actively moving as as you image it how do you keep registration between images and does that motion affect the quality of information you get from your images um yeah really good question so i didn't i didn't really go into the methodology um so the heart isn't physically beating so the heart is electrically beating but we uncouple the heart so we add drugs to the setup to the perfusion that stops the heart actually mechanically moving um, and it's only got the electrical activity so it's not moving when we do these experiments interesting that's that that that's great that's it's really fascinating um there's another one that's probably pretty short given that's asking given the size of the heart if you need a two photon laser for deeper penetration into the heart so yeah so we we don't use lasers the the excitation is just an led so all we're seeing is the surface of the heart at the moment we can't go any further down into the heart so we're not looking at the, the different layers so there are some techniques where you can slice the heart and you could look at say rings and then look at the different layers in the heart but for this it's just what's happening on the surface so whether this is transmural we don't we don't know Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think we'll move on to the next speaker. If there are more questions for you, I'm sure people will put them in the chat. Um, but thank you very much for a great talk. This is fascinating. Thank you. I want to second that. Thank you so much, Dr. Caldwell. Okay, our next talk is um, Dr. Catherine Situ. She's a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, the title of her talk is Adapting and Understanding Neural Networks for Scientific Image Analysis. So Dr. Situ, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks. Let me just share my screen. And then just go into presentation. Okay, so yeah, also hopefully you guys can all see that. And if you can't, just let me know. Um, so as Louisa said, I'm Catherine. I'm a postdoc at the National Center of Electron Microscopy, which is part of the Molecular Foundry at Berkeley National Lab. And I'm really honored to be sharing some of my work alongside other great woman microscopists today. And so I'll just be talking about how we can uh, utilize machine learning for better image analysis. Um, and given the really broad audience and also broad scope of this topic, I thought it'd be helpful to give some perspective as or some context as to my perspective on this topic. So my background is actually in nanoscience. And as Professor Ross mentioned earlier today, it's such an interesting field because everything changes when you bring things down to the nanoscale. Um, and specifically at this lens scale, structure generally dictates function. And so we can see this in a lot of different ways. So for example, in like chemical applications, like with catalysts, um, their catalytic activity can depend on their nanoparticle shape. And we can also see this is true for other things like optical properties. So for instance, here we have gold nanorods with different aspect ratios and macroscopically this, they show up as different colors. Um, and another way of thinking about this is basically that their optical properties are dependent on their nanoparticle structure. Um, and so my PhD was really focused on uncovering some of these structure function relationships using in situ TM, but more notably, once we understand these structure function relationships, we can then use this knowledge to then exploit those relationships and really discover new behavior and really like start controlling things. And so one thing might be um, initiating activity at oh, initiating activity at sites where activity normally doesn't happen. Um, and so as Professor Ross sort of showed um, in her talk, and since I also have this in situ TM background, you end up getting all of these really beautiful microscope videos. Um, but also as the person responsible for then analyzing all of those videos, it's a lot of work because especially with videos, you have to go frame by frame and they analyze them. And then once you do it for an entire video, you then need to do it for another video because you need particle statistics and it ends up being a lot. And then they say you they have a new camera, which now has an even faster frame rate. And while that's great for science, that means your pile of work has now increased by so much. And so there's really a need to handle our image processing much more automatically. 
And it's not just for video data as well. Let's say if you do nanoparticle synthesis and you want to evaluate how did my synthesis results come out, you want some way that'll quickly look at your images. And so you can spend less time hand analyzing your images and more time doing the science. And so I think it's really safe to say that all microscopists, whether electron, optical, or whatever your preferred technique, would really benefit from better image analysis methods. And so some of the most promising methods now are based off of neural networks, which is a specific type of machine learning. So you can see here in this example of if you had an image task of just identifying the nanoparticles in this image, the neural network just vastly outperforms a Gaussian mixture model, which is actually another type of machine learning. You can see it just does a much better job at picking up the nanoparticle features. Um, and this is also true for other image analysis tasks, for example, denoising. So here's, in this paper, they took some high-res TM images at pretty low signal-to-noise ratios. And you can see, again, that the neural network just denoises much better than the traditional filter techniques. So what exactly then makes neural networks so powerful? Where at their core, neural networks are these universal function approximators, meaning that they can take on any functional form, including extremely nonlinear equations that we might have trouble mathematically writing out. And they learn what function they're supposed to take on via a process called training. And so to train, we first collect data that we want the network to be familiar with, and then we collect and then we label it um, such that we tell the network what do we want it to learn from this data. And then we feed this data to a neural network, and then it updates its parameters or it learns as it goes through that training data. And then after iterating through this process a number of times, we can then um, use this trained neural network to process any data we want. So we can just you know, have some test image, new data, and then we feed it through the neural network and hopefully we'll get out the analysis that we want. And so really, after this whole process, there's really two main factors that affect the neural network performance. So one is the architecture or how we build up the neural network. If we build using certain functions or operations, we then make it easier or harder to learn certain image features or even functions that we want it to learn. Um, and the other is actually the training data or the data that we feed to it. Um, this training data really dictates what the network learns. Um, and so therefore the neural network's behavior is then highly influenced by the data that it is meant to analyze. And this is a really key aspect about these methods because the data that we deal with, scientific images, are pretty different from the images and the image analysis tasks that the computer vision or computer science community has traditionally worked with. Um, so for instance, in computer vision, there's this data set called ImageNet, which is 14 million labeled images. I personally don't work with data sets that are 14 million images large. And on top of that, labeling is really expensive. So it's probably pretty easy to find someone who can tell you that this is an image of an espresso machine, but it's probably much harder to find someone who can look at this image, TM image and identify all of the green boundaries. But not just the size of the image data sets are different, there's differences in the images themselves. So for instance, in natural images, we have a natural bias as to which way the images will face because of gravity. But with scientific images, microscopy, we're looking top down, and so we have this rotational invariance. But it's not just the images themselves, but also their data types. In computer science, they're used to working with extremely, like relatively small 256 by 256 digital images. Um, but on the other hand, as microscopists, we have spent a lot of money trying to get high resolution images with high, extremely high dynamic ranges. So pixel values zero to 60,000. Um, and so that is just really different from a digital image, which is bounded from zero to 255. And then finally, even how we evaluate performance is different. So for natural um, computer vision, they just want the best performance possible at whatever cost. But with scientific image processing, we not only want it to be accurate, but we want to be able to justify our 
decisions and explain why it's doing what it's doing. So if I had a network that isn't performing well, I want to be able to say it's not picking up on this feature or it's having trouble in this aspect. But also on the other end, if I have a network that's doing really well, I want to know what is exactly is it learning that I didn't know or figure out how to do so beforehand. And so this is really just a really long winded way of saying that all of these differences means that maybe just cutting and pasting the established computer vision methods into our scientific data might not be the most effective way of doing things. And so our research has really focused on understanding how these networks then behave when they're trained on TM data. And so as a starting point, um, I'm going to focus today, I'm talking about the task of identifying nanoparticles in TM images. And so some questions that we've been asking are how we can utilize prior knowledge of our sample, our microscope and our images to then inform how we train and we use neural networks. On the more specific side, once we decide we want to use neural networks, how do we decide on architecture? And how do the constraints that we put on the architecture then bias the function that we learn and also in the context of our scientific image features? But also on the usability side of how do my microscope and sample parameters affect how often I can use my neural network, how much it can generalize from one experiment to the other? And so, I sort of have not that much time today, so I'm just going to focus on one of these. Um, so I'm going to focus a bit more on talking about how architecture can influence performance. So we can describe neural network architecture in two ways. We can describe um, networks by their complexity or number of trainable parameters. And the way I like to think about this is in the simple example of curve fitting. So if I had a bunch of data, if I had a really simple curve or not that many trainable parameters, you know, it would give me something simple that honestly wouldn't be able to fit to all of the nuances of the data. But if I put in a curve with much more trainable parameters, I can now better fit that data. Um, the other way we can describe an architecture is by its receptive field or the area of the input image that can actually contribute to the output decision. And so we want to understand how these two parameters then affect performance, especially if we're interested in building in neural networks that are tailored for our data sets, which speaking of, um, so what are our data sets? So we're interested in TM images and with TM images, there's really two regimes. You have your standard TM images where the image task is really based off of contrast to distinguish the nanoparticle from the background. Um, but you also have high resolution TM images where now it's a slightly different image analysis problem. Not only do you have slight changes in contrast from nanoparticle to background, you also have changes in image texture. So the lattice fringes of the, of the crystalline nanoparticles tell you that here I'm looking at a nanoparticle and not the amorphous background. Um, and so we wanted to study how these two architectural constraints really affect performance with these two types of image analysis tasks. So I'll first start with standard TM images. So here I'm showing network performance as receptive field is changed, but keeping complexity constant. So what I'm showing is the performance of nine different neural network architectures as, again, we keep same number of training parameters and only modify the receptive field. Each dot is the average performance and standard deviation of five different training runs. And then we evaluate this using something called the dice score, which just gives us a measure of similarity between the output and the uh, ground truth. And generally one means it's an exact replica. And so what we can see here is that as we increase receptive field, we get pretty constant performance. It does drop a little, but overall it stays pretty constant. If we then repeat this for an even more complex network, more training parameters, but again, keeping the receptive field constant, we see the same exact trend in behavior. The network, the more complex network does slightly better, but overall it's constant. And then if we repeat this again, um, on even more complex, we see same as our trend. And so the takeaway here from this trend is that for the standard contrast-based um, classification problem, the receptive field doesn't matter that much. It's really complexity that is helping the neural network really learn the features. But to understand a bit more what's going on, we can take a qualitative look at the, at the results. So 
here I have a test image, so an image that the network was not trained on. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the results from three different networks with three different receptive fields, um, but the same complexity. And then here you can see the receptive field superimpose on the image. And you can see that for all three networks, they all perform extremely well, but notably they don't miss any of the um, Part of, uh, parts of the particle at the center. And so this basically tells us that our network is not relying on any edge finding algorithms. Um, in fact, the smallest receptive field is smaller than the radius of the average nanoparticle in this case. Okay, great. So how does this change when we move to high resolution TM images? So with high resolution TM, we start to see different behavior. In this case, we find that if we have a network architecture with same complexity, but varying receptive fields, we actually see an increase in performance and then a plateauing in behavior. And if I then repeat this on more complex networks, I see the same as that trend. And as I get to even more complex networks, this, the results basically lie right on top of each other. And so the takeaway here is that receptive field is actually the key parameter that's limiting performance in our small networks. And you can see that by, instead of going left to right, going right to left. So if I started off with a network with a large receptive field, as I shrink it down, I'm actually making performance worse. Um, the other really interesting takeaway from this is that we can actually take a lightweight network and actually get it to basically be on par with a much more complex network. So if you look at the light green curve here, I have an extremely simple network and all we've done is change the receptive field and I can get its performance to be somewhat on par with a much more complicated network. And this is really impactful for scientific images because the number of parameters in your network ends up dictating how large your training set has to be. Um, and so again, we can look qualitatively at our performance. So we can start off with an ideal um, high-res TM image, one where you can see all the lattice fringes. And again, if you look at all the receptive field sizes, you can see that all of the receptive field networks do honestly decently well. However, where we start to see differences in performance is when we have uh, particles where there's parts of the nanoparticle that are off the zone axis where the lattice fringe or nanoparticle texture is not as visible. Um, and so you can see here that with the small receptive field, it really struggles in this area where it's really co a contrast-based problem. But the larger receptive field now doesn't have an issue and can actually capture the convex nature of the nanoparticle and that change in contrast. Um, and so that was really quick, but hopefully um, giving you a taste of how powerful neural networks can be um, and exactly why we need to better understand them in our domain of interest. And specifically for TM imaging, um, high resolution TM images really benefit from networks with large receptive fields and not necessarily ones with high complexity. So if you have any questions, I know we're a little short on time, feel free to send me an email or just pop a question in chat. And I'd like to thank my funding uh, sources. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Catherine, for, for that great talk. It's very exciting. It's very similar to some work that I'm interested in. So I've been listening <laughs> very closely. Um, I don't think we have time for questions right now, but I'm sure people will put them in the chat. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that work. Thank you, Dr. Situ. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Lexi Walls. She's a scientist at the uh, University of Washington and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. All right, can everyone see my screen and hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so like, I, like uh, I was just introduced, my name is Lexi. I'm a scientist at the University of Washington in David Wiesler's lab. And I just wanna thank uh, the organizers for giving me the chance to share my work today. Um, and what I'm gonna be sharing is really um, kind of on a different scale than the, other, than the previous talks. And it's really asking the question of, can we use cryo-electron microscopy to help guide sars coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and therapeutic design? And so before I begin, I just wanna give a broad overview of 
you know, what coronaviruses are and what they look like. And so here's just a negative stain image of a, um, of a coronavirus taken many, many years ago. And what I really want to point out is this spike glycoprotein, which you can see decorating the outside of the virus. Um, and this is actually how coronaviruses got their name. They have a corona or a crown of this spike glycoprotein. And this protein is really, really important for the virus's function and also for our immune response to a, a viral infection. And so what we first did uh, way back in 2020, um, when you know, the pandemic was beginning, um, we really wanted to start by understanding what does the SARS coronavirus 2 spike look like? How is it different than previous spikes? And so we utilized cryoelectron microscopy to do that. So I'm showing just a typical micrograph of what we might see. And in the micrograph, what you're looking at are individual spike proteins. So not the entire virus, these uh, proteins have been purified. And on the bottom, you can see um, class averages. So we actually take thousands of images and then extract out just the single portion of our particle and then average those together. And what we really saw is that we kind of had these two classes of images coming out. One which you can see that the spike is in a closed conformation and one where it's slightly more open. And we kind of characterized this before in previous coronaviruses, myself and the field. Um, and what we kind of describe this as, as um, a down and an up conformation or closed and open. And the piece of the spike protein that's actually up in this open conformation is specifically the receptor binding domain. Now the receptor binding domain is extremely important both for the virus and for what I'm going to be talking about today. It's important for the virus because the receptor binding domain is the mechanism by which the spike protein and therefore the virus actually attaches to host cells, our cells and how it enters us. Um, and so right here, I'm just showing a crystal structure overlaid with ACE2, which is the, the human receptor that SARS coronavirus 2 uses to enter our cells. Now, there was still an open question at the beginning of the pandemic of, is the receptor binding domain really important for our immune response? And so I'm just showing right now, overlaid onto the structure of the spike protein, just the overall conservation. This was plotted back in 2020. We have many, many more sequences now, but the overall takeaway remains the same, that this top portion or the end terminal domain and the receptor binding domain are really low or really not conserved when we look at kind of within the family of coronaviruses. And so that suggested to us that there was kind of a reason that these weren't highly conserved and that that might be important. Um, and so a really talented technician in the laboratory, John Bowen, he did a beautiful experiment trying to understand which types of antibodies or where these antibodies are targeting that are important for our immune response. And so what we're showing on the left here is just neutralization of serum from people who have been immunized with either Moderna or Pfizer, either red or blue. Um, and we're showing that overall, they have really nice neutralization there. They produced antibodies that are capable of neutralizing the virus. However, when we take the exact same sera and we remove all antibodies capable of binding to the receptor binding domain or RBD, so this up or down uh, confirmation, um, what we see is that there's a dramatic loss of neutralization. This suggests that many um, of the neutralizing antibodies are actually targeting the receptor binding domain and not too many, although there is a slight decrease, are tar targeting the end terminal domain, which is out here. So that really got us thinking and trying to understand what is, the, what is the contribution of receptor binding domain targeting antibodies in terms of um, vaccine design and protection and therapeutics? And so we used cryoelectron microscopy in collaboration with a, with a company called Veer Biotech. Um, and what I'm showing you is many, many, many days and months of work all boiled down into one slide just because there's not a lot of time. But what we were able to do is isolate monoclonal antibodies from people who had either been infected with SARS coronavirus 2 or who had been vaccinated. And we were able to basically generate this antigenic map through structure and through identifying where these antibodies were binding specifically on the receptor binding domain, which now we know needs to be our target because of its protective effects. Um, and so we, we were able to do this. And as we were kind of figuring out, yes, the receptor binding domain is super important and antibodies targeting this domain are super important. 
we uh, sorry, we we also were kind of in this wave of variants. And so, you know, we've gone through many, many variants, and I'm just showing one, the most recent right now, which is the Omicron variant. And unfortunately, what we see is that most antibodies known that target the N-terminal domain, and even many that target the receptor binding domain are no longer functional in kind of this landscape of new um, mutations on the receptor binding domain. But some still are. So you can see there's still a smattering of those that have you know, a two to 10 fold loss um, of neutralizing capability. But this really got us thinking and wanting to understand further, you know, is the receptor binding domain the only thing that's giving us these cross neutralizing activities? And so I'm showing the exact same experiment again. Um, and what you can see is that when we look at you know, someone who is immunized with Moderna or Pfizer, when we look at their ability to neutralize Delta, another variant of concern, or Omicron, unfortunately, all of the neutralizing antibodies that are capable of handling these variants are targeting the receptor binding domain. So that really suggested to us that we needed to kind of think through and really understand how can we design a vaccine? What therapeutics can we make to really target the receptor binding domain? And here I'm just highlighting again, the structure of those um, those monoclonal antibodies that are still known to bind and neutralize the SARS coronavirus spike, even in the face of things like Omicron. So suggesting that we still have this ability to target very, very distinct sites on the receptor binding domain. And that really got us thinking. And we ended up teaming up with a team here at the University of Washington in the Institute for Protein Design. And what we ended up doing was designing a receptor binding domain based vaccine. And so what I'm showing on the left is the receptor binding domain in blue, a linker linked to a trimerization motif. Now this trimerization motif is a fully designed protein. It does not exist in, in nature. And it was designed for the sole purpose of assembling with another designed protein, this pentamer, and uh, assembling just in a test tube, nothing else required into this beautiful nanoparticle, which you can see modeled in the middle. And then you can see a negative stain image of um, on the right hand side. And I have a video, but I think if uh, for, for timing's sake, I won't show the video, um, but we can come back to it at the end if people want. But really the question is, does this vaccine work? Does this process work? Can we focus the immune system just to the receptor binding domain? And so what I'm showing in blue is when we immunize mice with the receptor binding domain nanoparticle, we get really strong neutralizing response. And when we challenge those mice who have been vaccinated, we see no evidence of, of um, breakthrough or, or anything like that. And so that really suggested to us that this was a viable technique and a, a viable way to move forward and to design a vaccine. And I'm really excited to say that this vaccine is currently in phase three clinical trials um, at SK Biosciences um, in South Korea. And we're patiently awaiting to, um, to hear the results and hear you know, how it's progressing and whether this vaccine, which is, um, which is scalable and really cheap, whether this can be used to continue to vaccinate the entire world. Um, and so that's really what we've been what we've been up to. We've also been wondering, can we make this even broader, you know, to handle variants or to handle the un unfortunate thought of the next pandemic? Um, and so we have some preliminary data to show that yes, we can utilize just the receptor binding domain on this nanoparticle platform to get a breadth of response, um, one that is protective against things that are present in the vaccine. And even if we take away components and still challenge the mice that have been immunized um, with a heterotypic challenge, so something not present in the vaccine formulation, we still get 100% protection from infection, which is really, really exciting um, and something we need to be thinking about as you know, we're undergoing this mutational landscape or even the, the potential of a, of a future emergence. Um, and so with that, I, I just want to kind of give an overview of what I've told you. So I've told you that we can utilize cryo-electron microscopy to, to determine the structure of novel pathogens and pieces of pathogens in multiple conformations. We can uh, basically generate antigenic landscape mapping through structure and to utilize structure to understand you know, how mutational landscapes will affect um, future, future you know, uh, 
function of those monoclonal antibodies um, and how we've utilized that antigenic map to really design um, kind of a next generation vaccine and how we're still continuing to push to improve upon this vaccine. Um, and this work was done with a lot, a lot, a lot of collaborators and a lot of funders. Um, and so without any of their help, this would not have been possible. Um, and finally, I just want to thank my lab and my advisor, David Wiesler. Um, they've all been super supportive in a really challenging time to be doing um, pandemic-based science. So I will stop there and I'm happy to take any questions and thank you again. Thank you so much for this talk. Uh, we can, I think we're, we can all see how, how important it is to, to have that kind of work and have microscopy and, and it feels like that. Um, we have a few questions. I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but I'll start with some. Uh, one of them is, uh, how susceptible is the receptor binding domain to mutations? Yeah, so the receptor binding domain is very mutationally plastic, but there are some regions that are kind of rigid. And so one of those regions is the the virus still needs to bind to its receptor ACE2. And so there's a lot of mutations that can happen, but there are some kind of, I guess, like unchangeable factors. Um, and the other problem is that because we have all of this, you know, all of these antibodies and all of this immune response targeted to the receptor binding domain, that has been hypothesized to also kind of be heightening the, the mutational landscape of the receptor binding domain. Um, so that's really why we've kind of pushed into looking, can we make the vaccine broader? Because if we can elicit, you know, or improve the response of these broad monoclonal antibodies that bind Omicron, that bind wild type, that bind SARS-1, then you could imagine that no matter what mutation comes up, we will still be able to generate a protective response. Oh, it's still in testing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. That that sounds incredibly exciting, and and I hope that that I mean for all of us that that works out well. Um, there's more in the chat. I don't think we have time for it, but if you have time after your talk, you can you can answer them yourself. But thank you so much for sharing this exciting work that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Walls. Um, okay, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Nirja Zambare from, uh, she's a Linus Pauling Distinguished Postdoc Fellow at um, the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, give me one second. I'm having the same issue I did during. Sure, it's okay. Uh, okay, I think. We're gonna go for it and I'm just gonna share my entire desktop again. Okay. Hopefully that will work. Do you see that? Yep, I see your, um, I see the presentation. You do? Okay, cool. Is that still okay? Yes, it's in presenter mode now. I will hide this. Yeah, sorry about that. We have a bunch of, I think with the new laptop, a bunch of, you know, security things that I haven't figured out yet. Okay, so hopefully you can see and hear. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Nirja and I'm a Linus Pauling uh, postdoc fellow at Pacific Northwest National Lab. And I quickly wanna give a shout out to the organizers. You've really chosen speakers from all different types of fields. It's really, it, you know, it goes to show how versatile microscopy really is. Um, I'm really honored to be here and I'm gonna talk about what my fellowship is about and it is focused on this micro scale imaging aspect of um, microbial biomineralization specific to calcium carbonate. So I'll be talking a lot about micro mineral interactions. And I want to start off, it lets me, okay. I wanna start off with um, appreciating geomicrobiology, which is all around. And we have micro mineral interactions going on absolutely all around us. Microbes can help in the formation or transformation of minerals, or they can also weather minerals. But in turn, minerals can provide a habitat for microbes to grow on and sometimes also provide nutrients. So this has implications in geological elemental cycling. Um, so the first thing I said, which was microbes helping in formation of minerals, uh, microbes can directly also form minerals in a process called biomineralization. And when I say biomineralization, maybe you're thinking of bones and teeth and shells, 
And these are absolutely biominerals, but the process behind these is an active biomineralization process where the organism cares about where the precipitate is forming, where it's not forming, how much is forming, et cetera. Um, but there's also active or passive biomineralization, which is more of induced mineralization. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, so the work I do is mostly in the field of microbially induced calcium carbonate precipitation. This is a mouthful, so I'll just call it MICP. And it can be brought about when metabolic processes raise alkalinity and pH in the surrounding of bacterial cells. Here are a couple SEM images of calcium carbonate that's been produced by bacteria in this way, specifically bacteria that can hydrolyze urea. So they undergo or they bring about ureolysis, causing the alkalinity and pH to rise. The image on the right is actually two shapes of calcium carbonate. So you see that bigger cube there, but then you also see those spiky uh, precipitates. So, and I'll talk about these morphologies of calcium carbonate pretty soon, but on that bigger cube, you see those indents and holes and you know, imprints of bacterial cells that helped make form the precipitate. In that image in the center in the circle, um, you see calcium carbonate precipitate that is kind of covered with the cells that have helped form it. Those are just false colored cells, but they um, are in very close association with the precipitate. So why should we care about something that's happening on such a small scale? Um, the precipitates formed by this process can be used as a biological cement for a ton of environmental applications. And it's actually a really cool idea to me because cement can't fix everything. For example, if you have subsurface failures or if you have carbon dioxide that's sequestered in the subsurface, um, it can leak back up into the air, which is obviously a huge waste of time, money, effort, everything. And cement can't fix these fractures. We need a water-based technique. Cement is too thick and it's too, um, it's high pH as well. So MICP being a water-based technique can infiltrate these small cracks. These tiny microbes can get into the small spaces and then make the precipitate around themselves. So they're acting like little engineers plugging different fractures. I think another cool aspect or application of this process is um, contaminant sequestration. So as the precipitates are forming, um, they can trap certain radionuclides or heavy metal contaminants, and therefore they're not flowing with the groundwater, but are sequestered into long-term precipitates. Speaking of long-term precipitates, we want these biocement seals or these sequestered precipitates to be long-term, right? So we want them to be stable. And uh, stability comes into question when you want specific polymorphs of calcium carbonate to form. So this comes back to the shapes thing I talked about, where you have different spikes or a cube structure of precipitate. So generally, it's accepted that calcium carbonate precipitation starts out as amorphous calcium carbonate, um, which is a non-crystalline form. And then that rapidly transforms to either vaterite or aragonite, and then finally into calcite. And calcite is the most thermodynamically stable phase. Um, so again, vaterite, aragonite, calcite are all calcium carbonate, just that the atom packing is different. So obviously, if I want to look at something at the atom packing level, I need the micro scale. And how am I going to look at this process at the micro scale um, unless I can visualize, you know, single or few cells interacting with the precipitate and making the precipitate? So I turn to droplet-based microfluidics where I um, have been making very, very tiny droplets, about 25 microns, and each droplet gets a single bacterial cell. And it also gets the other ingredients for MICP. So here, hopefully this video plays. Um, and this is my droplets farming, extremely slowed down version video of the droplets farming. Um, and each droplet will get my bacteria, they'll get urea and calcium, and then this specialized oil comes in and basically helps make the emulsion of water in oil. Like I said, this is super slow, but here is a video of my computer screen when I'm making them. And you can see that this is incredibly high throughput and you can control your experiment so you can design each drop needs to get one, exactly one bacterial cell or two, or if you're wanting to do like a more biofilm based assay, maybe a few to get the biofilm started, et cetera. So in our preliminary work, um, I chose a model to do one drop in 10 drops 
would get a single bacterial cell. That's why you see that you know not all those drops have um, cells in them, but the ones that do, we are working with GFP labeled bacteria that are able to bring about this process of precipitation. So the top row of images I'm going to show you um, are confocal laser scanning images, which will show fluorescence and autofluorescence of the precipitates. And then the bottom row is reflection imaging. So in day zero, we just have our drops with the individual cells in them. We have nothing in the reflection image, which means we don't have anything solid enough yet to reflect light. By day one, we see that the cells have grown and the reflection images show us that there is something beginning to form in the precipitates. Um, by day two, I was able to see two different morphologies of these precipitates. One was this diffuse looking precipitate. Uh, so you see my cursor since I'm sharing desktop, but more, one was this more diffuse looking precipitate and one was this more compact spherical precipitate that actually had an autofluorescence associated with it. And then we carry out these experiments for a number of days and collect the precipitates or extract them from the drops and uh, analyze them for a bunch of things that I'll talk about. One thing I wanna mention in this video is every drop that has cells, so the green, um, you'll see that the cells are in proximity to the precipitate. And whenever you see that spherical precipitate, that precipitate is actually moving along with the cells. So there's some evidence of the cells being you know, stuck to the precipitate or somehow cemented onto the precipitate. Just keep that in mind going forward. So when I extract the precipitates from the drops, this is what it looks like under an SEM. And you see those more compact spheres kind of interspersed with the more diffuse looking material. And we knew that this was likely calcium carbonate because this process has been studied really well and had done you know, negative controls, taking one ingredient away with no precipitate. So we knew this was calcium carbonate, but EDX was our first indication that this is calcium carbonate because we found atomic ratios of 113 for calcium carbon oxygen. But a more robust way of analyzing these precipitates um, was Raman microspectroscopy, where we found that the more diffuse looking precipitate had very weak calcium carbonate um, spectra. So that was likely amorphous calcium carbonate, also because it looks like amorphous calcium carbonate. But the spheres, their uh, spectra were more similar to the vaterite phase of or vaterite polymorph of calcium carbonate and not calcite. And I say it like that because we knew that they were autofluorescent. We knew the precipitates were autofluorescent and autofluorescence for calcium carbonate has only been documented for the calcite phase. So this was our first sign that, okay, maybe there's more than one polymorph even within a single tiny microprecipitate. Um, another thing on this slide is that you see the green from the cells coming through this exterior that's, that the cells are kind of wrapped in. And maybe that's more obvious in this SEM image where you have a single microprecipitate with these extensions. And these extensions are roughly the size and shape of the cells that I'm using. Um, so that's kind of cool because the cells are making the precipitate, but then they're also making precipitate around themselves. And we know it's precipitate because EDS you know, indicated that there's calcium present in the extensions. We also did some TEM work on this, and this was all now, everything so far was at Montana State University, but everything now on is going to be Pacific Northwest National Lab Research. Um, we did some TEM work on these uh, precipitates, but obviously the precipitates are quite large, so we couldn't get too much TEM data from them, but we got data from um, the bacterial cell extensions. And even then, you know, at higher resolution, we were just our higher magnification, we were just able to see that, yes, there are crystalline objects on these cells. Um, with SEM, we saw that these cell extensions um, are definitely covered in the same material or similar material as the precipitate. And I really like the image on the top right. Um, I think you're looking at a bacterial cell that's either bent into the, or I guess coming out of your screen now. Um, we're maybe looking at a cell uh, fossil that was broken, but you're able to see the precipitate covering on an individual bacterial cell. So um, we've established that there's a connection and even a spatial relationship between the bacterial cell and the precipitate that it forms. Now we wanted to see 
how what this relationship really is. So a very elementary kind of uh, project that we started was just testing this with two different strains of urolytic bacteria. So the paper we're working on right now looks at two different bacteria. And the first one makes these smooth precipitate aggregates. And I know smooth is not a very scientific term, but you'll see why I'm using it soon. Um, so their surface, although, you know, um, a little coarse is relatively smooth uh, compared to the next precipitate I'll show you. But while still on this slide, I want to show you what happens when we fib mill into these precipitates. We see that the interior is also smooth or homogeneous compared to our other bacterium that makes not aggregates anymore, but a single sphere, which I thought was really cool because it's the same mechanism is the same like you know biochemistry behind the equation but we're forming completely different looking precipitates but still calcium carbonate so now we have a precipitate that is um higher grain size on the exterior but when you cut into it it looks phenomenal it looks like these cavities almost they have a shell and then the inside is full of almost pitted looking material so we're working on characterizing what these are. And this is important because I'll bring you back to the earlier discrepancy where Raman told us that these precipitates have vaterite, but autofluorescence tells us they have calcite. So not only do different bacteria in our case are making different looking precipitates, but even within a single precipitate, we seem to have this, you know, difference in morphology that you can just see with your eyes or with electron microscopy, I should say. You see that the inside is different than the outside. So Maybe the inside is one uh, polymorph and then the outside is another. But to analyze this or to answer this question, we need to turn to microanalysis. And this has involved a lot of FIB work um, because what we're trying to do is get a thin section of a single microprecipitate and then try to map out um, which polymorph is present where using scanning transmission electron microscopy and more specifically diffraction. So this image on the left is you know, a thin section of one microprecipitate, and we're trying to get data from different spots to see which polymorph is present. And we're also doing sticks and zanes. And actually, I should say we're doing sticks and zanes before we do the diffraction, because diffraction is more destructive. But Stixim is scanning transmission x-ray microscopy. And with x-rays, we're probing our samples um, to get uh, spectra that will give us data on the organics present. So in this image on the right, um, you're looking at like one part of one slice of one precipitate. And I would ask you to ignore the blue because that's actually not part of the sample, but the green and red are both calcium carbonate. But looking at the organics or looking at the CKH spectra, we see that one part of the precipitate seems to be, seems to have more organics or at least more discernible organic peaks. So that's interesting that that can happen within a single precipitate. So again, the goal here would be to spatially map the polymorphs and then cross-reference that with organics data to see how, how they correlate, basically. So I've talked a lot about you know, the super micro-scale microanalysis work, and I just want to bring everyone back to why this matters. Yes, it is extremely fundamental science, but um, any large-scale application of MICP um, is going to be driven by these micro-mineral interactions at the micro scale. And not just MICP, that's one example of one environmental application of a biomimetic approach being biomineralization. But micro-mineral interactions are everywhere, and we have a lot of potential to harness them for maybe energy purposes like electrical energy or electrosynthesis, or in the industry for leaching metals or recovering you know, metals from or even acid mine drainage. There's a ton of applications for um, micro mineral interactions there. And with that, I want to thank all my collaborators at the Environmental Molecular Science Lab at Pacific Northwest National Lab, because it's Women's Day. I'm going to shout out. I'm going to give a shout out to Alice Donalkova. She's an excellent mentor. And of course, thank you to all the MSU collaborators and the Advanced Light Source Synchrotron Facility for the sticks and work. And all our funding um, comes from the US DOE. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. It's always exciting to see how much you can learn if you just look closely enough at things. Um, I don't think we have time for questions, unfortunately, but if people do have questions, please put them in the chat. We've had great discussions going on 
uh, there throughout all these talks. And I want to thank you and all of the other speakers for showing all their wonderful and exciting work in those many fields of microscopy. Thank you so much. <laughs>